Okay, we are live on YouTube and I'm going to hit recording now um, in case um, no one um, realized or saw it through the email, we are recording. So if you um, have issues with that, go ahead and, um, um, and, and I will be sending that through an email. So thank you everyone for joining the Cavern Library and the Master Garners and our um, Garner Smarter. Today we will be um, talking about saving pollinators in your yard. Um, the next presentation will be next Saturday and we will be discussing starting a garden, um, excuse me, rain garden. So if you haven't registered for that, um, you can start registering through the Calvert Library. And then we have a couple ones in April, which are also open for registration. Um, I will be uh, monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, you can put your questions for Adisa um, on chat and I will be asking her at the end of her presentation. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Adisa. And thank you for do, um, doing the, this, this Saturday's Garden and Smarter. Hey Jennifer, um, I'm Elisa. I'm a Cabaret Master Garner and pictured here on the first slide is the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. It is um, the state um, insect for Maryland. It's also a rare and threatened species and hopefully you'll learn how to save this butterfly by the time we complete this presentation. And we'll get to the next slide. Okay, so like I said, I am part of the um, Cabaret Master Garners. I took some training through the University of Maryland, and I get all my um, work as far as volunteer work through the Maryland Extension. It works with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Department. Um, we also do several other programs as Cabaret Master Gardeners, AYS, composting, grow it, eat it, native plants, pollinators, and some, a few of us have taken the plant clinic training as well. Like Jennifer said, we will be having another presentation next week on rain gardens. It starts again at 10 a.m. and you can register through the Cabaret Library. We also will be having a plant sale. It will be for, um, digital, so um, there should be some information shortly on the Cabaret Extension website um, with details about how the plant sale is going to be um, run this year. So look to that website as well. Okay, let's get started. Sorry, it's kind of, um, here we go. Here's the first slide. Oh, and I forgot to um, mention the Cabaret Master Garner's mission statement. The um, is to educate our community about safe, effective, and sustainable horticulture practices that build healthy gardens, landscapes, and communities. Okay, so let's go and talk about what is a pollinator. A pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of the flower, the stamen, to the female part of the same or another flower, the stigma. The movement of pollen must occur for the plant in order to produce fruits, seeds, and young plants. Some plants are self-pollinating, pollinating with others may be fertilized by pollen pollen carried by wind and water. So other flowers are pollinated by insects and animals, such as bees, wasps, moths, butterflies, birds, flies, and small mammals, including bats. So I've pictured here all the different types of pollinators. Okay, let's talk about pollinating process a little bit more. So um, wind is, um, 
Plants that get wind pollination include grasses, conifers, and oaks. It's about 20% of flowering plants release and receive pollen by the wind. Water occurs with flower aquatic plants. Um, animals take um, as far as pollination process. 90% of plants rely on animals to receive their pollen from insects being larger, the largest group of pollinators. Flowering plants rely on this type. The importance of animal pollination, as pollinators feed there, they move grain or pollen from flower to flower on the same plant or from flower to flower on different plants. In some cases, pollen is the only food source for the pollinator. Not all eat nectar. Depending on the plant species, its flowers may be visited by a number of different pollinator types or it may attract a very narrow group of pollinators. Some pollinators even function as keystone species in many ecosystems. A keystone species is when a species depends on another species. If or when a keystone species becomes extinct or it vanishes from an ecosystem in which it has evolved, that ecosystem fund fundamentally changes and usually not for the better. Many pollinators are part of the complex food web. Food webs are the basis of all ecosystems. When you plant a garden, consider that you're really planning for food webs, not only for specific species. Specialist pollinators evolve with certain plants. They depend on 80% of insect-based crop pollination is performed by bees. Okay, so pollinate all pollinators, um, whether you're talking about bees, butterflies, other insects, including bats are at risk. These causes include habitat loss, widespread pesticide use, and climate change. Um, you're probably wondering what you can do. You can plant native flowers, rethink your lawn, plant more flowers, plan for bloom seasons around, skip the hybrid plants. They produce very little pollen for pollinators. Avoid using herbicides or pesticides as they are toxic to bees. Allow spiders and native bugs to do their job. Create a bee bath. Okay, so we're now on to insecticides and herbicides and why they are, um, they cause problems for pollinators. More than 1 billion pounds of insecticides are used annually in just the United States. Insecticides are widely used in agriculture, rangelands, woodlands, and other natural areas, waterways, golf courses, residential lawn, and gardens, sport fields, long roadsides, roadsides, and on street street trees. Studies have shown that more insecticides are used in urban and suburban areas than agricultural areas. Eighty-three percent of the land in the United States are under private ownership. In the U.S. a forty million acres of turf grass which is the eight times the size of New Jersey makes up the number one irrigation crop, which is basically grass. Insecticide equals kills insects and will and can kill butterflies, moths, and bees if you use where they are fed. The most dangerous type of insecticide is something that's called a neonicotinoid. <laughs> The long word. <laughs> and I will talk more about that. Okay, so neonicotinoids are symptomatic chemicals similar in structure and action to nicotine and works by blocking nerve impulses in insects and invertebrates. It is a widely used group of insecticide in the world employed broadly in the nursery industry and beyond. Geologically, 
surveys, geological surveys find these chemicals in stream samples across the United States. After one single application, neanthinoids can remain in the soil for months or even years. Residues have been found on woody plants up to six years after a single application. Um, neanthinoids not only have been found in sprays, but they have been found as an active ingredient on coated seeds, such as on corn, sunflowers, and many other crops and flowers. So this picture just shows um, how dangerous it is. Um, if you spray it, if you have somebody spray your lawn, or if you plant a seed um, with this coating, it goes into the plant, then insects feed off the plant and they take it to their hive or living place. Um, they get disoriented. Um, like I said, that it affects their um, nerve system. Um, and then it runs off into the streams and makes it very um, hard for other creatures like fish and frogs to live into those streams. And then um, it doesn't stop there, it gets into the rainwater and then just the vicious cycle keeps going and going and going. So I'm gonna talk briefly about um, using natives versus non-native plants. I will talk about specific pollinators later on the talk. Um, so um, this is why you should go native. Non-native plant species been planted in American gardens for centuries as part of botanical collections. Unfortunately, many of these species have learned to accept and love their new environment. Invasive plant species are large and growing threat and critically crowd crowding native plants. Encroaching of invasive plants leads to decline in butterfly and moth host plants. Grow growing more Natives means feeding more, many more pollinators than non-native plants. Invasive plants include the wavy leaf basket grass, garlic mustard, um, Bradford pear, burning bush, butterfly bush, the Chinese and Japanese wisteria, English ivy, Japanese honeysuckle, the Japanese knotweed, multi-flower rose, Mile Minute Vine, Norway Maple, and the Tree of Heaven. So once um, established, a native plant generally requires very little maintenance. Native plants are those that occur naturally in a regional region in which they evolved in, and they are ecologically basis upon which life depends, including birds and people. I'm gonna talk briefly about the root systems between the two. So as you can see, non-natives don't really have that long of a root system. So when it rains, all that rainwater will basically filter out. As you can see, native plants have deeper root systems that sustainably increase the ability of soil to absorb and retain water. Therefore, they are more drought tolerant as native vegeta vegetation is replaced with poplar turf grass, less storm water is absorbed into the ground, leading to more storm water runoff and water pollution. So if you have a, a spot in your yard that just seems to be flooded every time it rains, it's better off to plant something that is native than non-native because the native plant will absorb that water and use it when it's needed, especially when we have those heavy drought periods in the summer. Okay, so just like if you were to create a bird garden, pollinator, creating a pollinator garden is no different. You have to provide um, the same type of items into a pollinator garden as if you were doing a 
another wildlife garden. So the first thing you need to think about is food. Native plants form the foundation of the food chain in the natural world and should do the same in your wildlife friendly garden or landscape. Plants provide food to wildlife in a wide variety of ways, from berries to nuts to nectar and even insects they support that feed other animals. Plants that provide food for bees include New England aster, bergamot, blanket flower, sneezeweed, self-heal, salvia, um, and rosin weed. Plants that provide food for butterflies include black-eyed Susan, blazing star, coneflower, cup flower, golden wand, joe pie weed, lobelia, and milkweed. So these are plants that are providing the nectar for these creatures. Also, people forget that um, just like any other creature, bees and butterflies need a source of water. Um, and they need clean drinking water to survive. Um, bees um, like using a shallow dish filled with rocks or marbles is ideal. Just keep the water line shallower than the rocks so that the bees have a place to land. It's equally important to make sure the dish of water you're putting out for thirsty bees hasn't been contaminated with pesticides and also keep it clean by washing it out um, periodically. Butterflies, you can use a shallow dish placed on a stand among some rocks in the garden or even on a tree stump, as long as it's in a location with some of their favorite plants nearby, they'll come. Also, if you keep a little bit of bare soil for butterflies, they'll actually get some water from wet mud, so you can do that as well. Okay. The next thing that both um, all pollinators, whether you're talking about bees, butterflies, or um, the other type of pollinators, they also need cover. So cover um, includes um, growing plants in a group of clumps give bees and butters safe cover from predators and extreme weather. Um, heavy rains and snow to searing summer heat, um, these plants will provide cover for these um, creatures. Plant vegetative windbreaks to help shelter and protect pollinators on windy days. Trees, shrubs, and native grass grasses and flowering woody plants are particular effective as windbreaks. So wind can be disastrous, not only to bees, but also to butterflies. So it's always good to have a few shrubs within your pollinator garden to break up the wind so that if we have a windy day, they can go into the, that shrub and shelter there until the wind breaks. They also need places to raise their young. So, um, but to ensure that species continue to survive in your area, they need to reproduce. In addition, some species such as amphibians or butterflies have totally different habitat needs in their juvenile phases than they do as adults, often habitat in all phases of life cycles. So pollinators need nesting material, and this includes um, caterpillar host plants, which includes milkweed, buttonbush, black locust, wild indigo, sunflower, and um, a few rosin weeds. Okay. Sustainable practices. So once you get all those four covered, maintaining the garden is equally and probably the most important part of creating a pollinator garden. Um, how you manage your garden is critical important. Maintaining your landscape in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way ensures that the soil, air, and water that native wildlife and people rely upon stay clean and healthy. Plant for all seasons and sizes. Bees are, and other pollinators need blossoms from early spring to late autumn. 
Decrease your lawn area, bring back vegetation that used to be on your lawn. Plant green mulch, which is using native ground covers along with taller plants. More plant species intermingling with will help heal compacted soil, improve stormwater filtration, and nurture microorganisms. Let fallen leaves be and the decaying logs lie. They are a habitat for many beneficial insects, which includes um, insects and animals, which includes reptiles, amphibians, bees, beetles, and caterpillars. More or less, when you do mow your lawn, mow from the middle out rather than starting from the edging and grow more native plants along the edging of your lawn to provide safe havens for wildlife. Okay, so basically when you save butterflies, you will save all these creatures from birds to hawks to foxes and squirrels and fish. I'm going to talk about um, the various varieties of pollinators next. So um, types of pollinators, typically people think of bees and butterflies, but pollinators also include um, beetles, moths, flies, wasps, ants, mosquitoes, birds, mammals, and lizards. So bees, most important group of pollination for food crop. Bee, beetles are the largest group of insect pollinators and most ignored. Butterflies often secondary pollinators, but some are very important. Moths usually nocturnal, but some species are active during the day. Flies often bee mimics, identified by one only one pair of wings. Wasps, less efficient pollinators than bees, specialized, but specialist wasps on figs and orchids. Ants are also pollinators. Um, they're nectar loving, but not very effective at pollinator, pollination. Mosquitoes, limited pollinators of certain native orchids. Birds, pollinating birds include hummingbirds, spider hunts, some birds, honey creepers, honey eaters, and some parrots. Mammals, pollinating mammals include some species of bats, marsupials, monkeys, lemurs, and rodents. And lizards, pollinating lizards are found mostly on islands. Okay, let's talk about what is a generous versus a specialist. Gentlemen, such as honeybees and bumblebees, can sip nectar from an array of flowering plants. While most pollinators are gentlemen, approximately 75% of bee species, some have evolved as specials and may depend on particular plant species or small group of plants. The specialists include spring UTB. Only collects pollen from two species of plants, the Virginia spring beauty and the Carolina spring beauty. Without spring beauty B, these two plants may not be able to produce flowers or their um, berries. Make sure to include both, ugh, make sure to include plants for both generalists and specialist pollinators in your garden. Butterfly caterpillars also have specialist relationships with plants called larval host plants, which I will um, go a little bit deeper when I get to into the butterfly um, section of my presentation. Okay, let's talk about the first pollinator. Oh, sorry. Let's talk about what makes a, a good pollination plant. Okay, so what makes a good pollinator plant? It includes ultra invitations. Bees can see ultraviolet light, but not red light. Thus, flowers in ultraviolet range attract more bee visits, while red hued flowers reduce them. Color phases many flowers signal 
pollinators by changing color at different stages of development, attracting pollinators when they need the most, thus increasing the efficiency of pollinators they depend on. Nectar guides contrasting patterns of flower shades, tints, and tones further direct pollinators towards floral rewards such as nectar or pollen, much like the nighttime when away lights on an airport. Fragrance, minty or sweet, musky or ethereal, pungent or putrid flora or odors result from variations in chemical compounds. Fragrances can attract pollen particular pollinators over long distances varying in concentration, intensity, accounting to species, flower, and age site conditions. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, let's go there. Okay. So choosing a garden site, make sure to choose sunny open areas when possible. Emphasize native plants, plant for a continuous succession of blooms throughout the growing season. Have at least three different plant species and bloom at the, the same time. Vary um, flower sizes, flower colors, flower structures of plants. Group each plant species into a clump of three feet square or larger. Space plants so they can grow to their maturity with, so you don't want to grow your plants too close to each other. You wanna make sure that they still have space to grow to maturity. Space plants close enough to eliminate large gaps between plants at maturity. Combine plants that have similar growth habitats or habits and are equally, um, so if they're competitive, um, make sure you grow equally competitive plants with each other. Okay, shown here is the blooming chart. Um, I made it easy for everybody to think about the um, plants that have very similar blooming um, times. So in the early spring, which we're right now um, handling, we're seeing a lot of red maple, um, pussy willow, witch hazel, service berry, and some red buds should be um, blooming shortly. Then in the mid spring is the golden Alexander and creeping fox, spotted geranium, Virginia water leaf, and wild bleeding hearts. And then later in the season, Winterberry, blue wild indigo, spider wart, cana violet, and black cherry. And then once we get closer to the summer, um, we're gonna see sundial lumpines, bearded tongue, smooth hydrangea, and button bush. And then in the middle of the summer, maybe close to like June or July, you'll go and see the common milkweed, coneflowers. Joe pie weed and wild bergamot. And then later, like towards August, we'll see purple giant hyssop, false sunflowers, obedient plant, and the New Jersey tea. And then once we get into September, all the way to November and sometimes December, we'll see the New England aster, common bone set, white wood aster, winkle leaf, golden rod. Closed or the bottle, gentian, woodland sunflower, sneezeweed, white turtle head, and New York aster. Okay. Okay. So these are most of the types that we're going to talk about. Um, the type of pollinators that we're going to talk about. Okay, so unfortunately, when people think of beetles, they think of the Japanese beetles. Um, they were first introduced to the United States in 1916 after being accidentally introduced into New Jersey. 
They are also a non-native invasive species. They're so bad because they basically eat everything as adults. They are, um, they're actually love um, turf grass as um, baby beetles. So um, the host plant for the Japanese beetle is actually grass. So the bigger the lawn you have, you're actually inviting Japanese beetles into your yard by having a large base of turf grass because turf grass is also the Japanese beetle host plant. So the best way to reduce your Japanese beetle um, population is to limit the amount of your lawn, reduce your lawn. So good beetles include this ground beetle, ladybugs, fireflies, soldier beetle, and tiger beetles. So beetles are the most diverse insect order with more than 350,000 species, 24,000 in North America alone, ground beetles being one of the most common species. There are over 2,000 species of ground beetles in North America alone. Both adult and larvae ground beetles consume mites, snails, slugs, caterpillars, earwigs, cut worms, vine borers, aphids, and lots of other insects. Each beetle can eat more than its own body weight in prey insects every night. So the ground beetle to the left is a good insect to have in your garden. They are also one of the least insect species gardeners rarely garden for. To help attract ground beetles, you should provide two things cover and water. Provide cover by sending out stones or bricks for the ground beetle to hide under during the day. They also like to hide under mulch. Grounded up leaves will also do. Okay, so beetles are known as the guardians of the garden and the type of plants that they are more inclined to like are um, plants that are often dull, white, or green. The structure of the plant is often bowl-shaped, and the aroma of the plant is strong, fruity, or fetid, and usually the nectar is um, present in the plant, and there's a lot of pollen, so they like plants with a lot of pollen. Um, some of the plants that Beetles are attracted to include native onion and garlic, jack in the pulpit, goat's beard, milkweeds, pawpaws, sweet shrubs, spice bushes, magnolias, crab apples, water lilies, golden rods, spirillas, and meadow sweets and asters. They're also attracted to coreopsis, dill and fennel yellow, parsley, and cosmos. Okay, so we're gonna um, go to everybody's favorite pollinator, which is bees. Um, bees are the most efficient pollinators because they move constantly among flowers of the same species. Bees are more more common than birds and butterflies with five states, about 2.2 trillion bees are produced in a year. Um, live on pollen and only pollen. Some bees only come out at night. Bees carries pollen by coning their bodies with it and then carrying that pollen to their nest to feed young and the colony. Bees can be picky. There are generalist feeders, bees who like different species of plants, and specialist bees on, who only prefer one type of plant pollen. Um, there are eight species of bees who only like willow tree pollen. So there are eight species that we know of that um, of bees that like only willow tree. There are nine families in the bee family. 
Um, they're listed there. Five of the families of bees have been identified in Marinum, um, which include the Apidae, the Hautidae, <laughs> sorry for my Latin <laughs> or lack of, Andridae, the Mega Chilidae, and the Colitidae. So these include bumblebees, sweat bees, mining bees, mason bees, and the solitary bee. Bees are typically a soft yellow or yellowish brown with dark stripes on the abdomen. The stripes are a warning to the predator that is, this insect will sting to defend itself or its home. Bees drink their food through a tube-like tongue. And like I said, there's 20,000 species found in every continent except Antarctica. Okay. What's next? Okay. So these are some of the rare species in Marinan. There's over 450 species of bees that have been documented, like I said, in Marinan. 70% of native bee nest in the ground. Almost all are solitary. So these include the American bumblebee, the black and gold bumblebee, the brown belted bumblebee, the leaf colored bee, mining bee, and the north carpenter bee. Okay, bumblebees are endangered. According to the Exis societies, there are seven species of bumblebees now on the endangered list. The Westy Patch Bumblebee species has an overall decline of 87% since the late 90s. There are approximately 265 species of bumblebees in the world. They nest underground. Over 10 species of bumblebees are found in Maryland. These include the Westy Patch Bumblebee, the Franklin Bumblebee, the Western Bumblebee, the Yellow Banded Bumblebee, the obscure bumblebee, the crouch bumblebee, yellow bumblebee, southern plain bumblebee, the Morrison bumblebee, American bumblebee, and the variable cuckoo bumblebee. So we have all seven of these in Marinan. Okay, most people get confused between the bumblebee versus the comprender bee. So here's how to tell. The bumblebee nests underground and have been known to nest in used chickadee and mouse nests. Animals will leave the nest because they remember the sting. They're high social and live individual cells within a colony. Both male and female bees will sting if you provoke and in order to protect their colony. So they're the they're a little bit bigger. Um they um they, they're, they're like a big bee. They kind of big and round bodies versus the carpenter bee. It nests in softwood, conifers, pines, firs, and spruces, um, and are not social insects. They look like a bumblebee. Males are unable to sting, but females will sting if provoked. And they're a little bit smaller than a bumblebee if you if you compare the two pictures and their body shapes are a little different. Honeybees. Above is a fossilized honeybee that lived in North America 14 million years discovered in Nevada. Um, some between that time until the 1622 when the early colonists, by the time the early colonists came, um, we no longer had honeybees living in North America. And then they brought them over by the early colonists in 1622. But by the time the early colonists came, there were probably no honeybees at that time. Today, there are no native honeybees um, living in North America, all of them are being imported from other locations. Okay, the life cycle. So 
When you're thinking about creating a pollinator garden, you have to think of the life cycle of the pollinator you want to bring into your garden. So bees start as an egg, then larva, then pupa, and then adult. So um, most bees will um, start somewhere in the ground. Like I said, um, majority of our native bees live in the ground and that's where they'll start and then they'll go into larva stage and then they'll grow um they'll be fed by the queen bee um through the larva stage into the pupa and then they'll they'll come out of the pupa stage and then become an adult and basically feed on their own Okay, so what exactly do bees need in order to, to survive? The plants that they are more attracted to are bright white, yellow, blue, violet, purple, or ultraviolet. In structure, they're, they're not really too picky as far as structure aroma. They like um, plants that have a mild fragrant scent. Um, they love plants that the nectar is present. Um, they often go to plants that are often sticky and scented. So our native bees, um, they pollinate things like the giant hyssop, native onion, milkweed, wild indigo, prairie clovers, sunflowers, blazing star, new pines, bee, palm, bee balm, or bergamot, bearded tongues, golden rod, and asters. And our honeybees that we import, um, they are attracted to anise hyssop, fireweed, cone flower, joe pie weed, sunflower, sumacs, golden rods, asters, ironweeds, and pulver roots. Let's see. I also have a list of what our wasp um, population tends to pollinate. So remember, some of our plants do get pollinated by wasps. So they include milkweed, common bone set, sunflowers, false sunflower, mountain mint, go to wands, asters, and, and alexanders. So some of the favorites of most bees include blue false indigo, Russian sage, wasn weed, purple cone flower, and button bush. So provide both food and water sources and choose plants that are hardy, native and low maintenance varieties, mix annual perennials and shrubs that bloom in succession so that nectar and pollen will be available through out the growing season, early spring plants that bloom include snowdrops, will give bees a source of food early on, whereas New York ironweed and golden wand will provide nectar later in the fall. And it's always important um, that you have plants that are early bloomers, because what happens is the queen bee of the bumblebee will come out of the ground and she will be one of the first bees you see because she is looking around for a um, spot to create her new hive and she will she will spend most of the spring um, getting a nest started and basically um, producing her bees and then those bees She'll, she'll feed them and, and some of the worker bees um, will, um, will come out and then they'll start the whole process um, feeding um, the little colony because bumblebees is one of the few that will have a little colony in the ground. Because when we think of bees, we only think of, of honeybees having a colony, but there are other bees that have little colonies and some that will will just produce and then um, give them enough pollen to survive at all stages. And then those will come, those bees will come out and, and basically 
pollinate from flower to flower as well. Let's go on to everybody's favorite, which is the butterfly. So like I said in the beginning, the Baltimore checker spot is a medium-sized butterfly in the um, family of Nymphidae, the brush-footed butterflies, named for their reduced front legs. Baltimore checker spot colonies are located in early succession, stream wet, stream, sorry, stream fed wet meadows with few trees and shrubs. Caterpillars love the white turtle head as adults and are attracted to milkweed, dogbane, mountain mint, and wild blackberry. So the caterpillar host plant for the Baltimore checker spot is the white turtle head. They will go and feed on the flower as they become adults, but um, what they eat as young um, caterpillars is the white turtle head. Butterflies, they are maybe at the bottom of the food chain, but they are an important part of the ecosystem or web of life. Caterpillars, moths, and butterflies are an important food source for birds, dragonflies, lizards, spiders, and other invertebrates. Butterflies are in peril around the world. 80, oh, sorry, 800 species in the United States and 17 percent of them are at risk of extinction. The monarch and the Baltimore checker spot are just two examples. Many species of moths and butterflies are what you would call specialized eaters. They co-evolved with the special, a specific plant and live on that plant or species of plant as a source of food. The monarch co-evolved with the milkweed, the butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot, where fly co-evolved with the white turtle head. Let's see. And then um, pictured below are just a few samples of butterflies and skippers that you'll find here in Maryland. It includes, so I'm gonna go left to right, so it includes the spice Bush swallowtail, the zebra swallowtail, the beautiful red spotted purple, the painted lady, and the eastern swallowtail. So we have over 150 species of butterflies and skippers here in Maryland. So like the bees, butterflies have their own life cycle. So an adult butterfly will um, female butterfly will lay her egg on a leaf of the host plant and that egg will sit there until it grows up to be a caterpillar and the caterpillar will spend a few weeks um, of their lives eating the host plant. So pictured here is the monarch caterpillar. So it's chewing away at milkweed and once it has eaten enough um, to grow into a really fat caterpillar, they'll go and become a chrysalis. And while in chrysalis form, they will start um, changing into a butterfly until they emerge as a beautiful dot butterfly. And then they will feed um, the pollen um, and go and visit flowers um, in your garden. Now moths have a very similar um, life cycle. They'll go through the whole process, but a lot of moths in particular, the um, Nila moth, um, as adults, they don't eat because they lost that ability to um, while becoming moths. They didn't, um, basically a mouth wasn't formed. So what Luna moths will do is they will just basically lay eggs and they only are moths for a very short time until they perish. So moths don't have it. The, um, a lot of moths um, don't have a very long um, adult stage. They, they have a, a much greater um, caterpillar stage than um, moth stage. 
Okay, so what do exactly caterpillars eat? Many caterpillars are specialists, so they only eat only one type of food. So our spiceful swallowtail, like sassafras and spice bushes, the zebra swallowtail likes pawpaws, the beautiful red spotted purple likes cherries and willows, the monarch of course likes milkweed, the painted lady um, enjoys pearly evening nesting, thistle and mallows, um, the eastern tiger swallowtail likes wild cherry, black cherry, sweet bay, magnolia, basswood, tulip tree, birch, ash, cottonwood, mountain ash, poplar, and willow. The frosted elf thing is um, likes blue frost, indigo, and lime pine. So these are just a few of our specialist butterflies. We have a lot more specialist butterflies um, who live in Maryland, but these are just a few of them. Okay. Okay. So there are um, a few plants I'd like to call as the superfood. Um, milkweed um, is a superfood because it supports not only monarchs, but 11 other species of butterflies and moths. And moths. Um, Coneflowers and the Rudebeckia support the pearl crescent, silver, silvery checker spot, the wavy line, emerald, and 12 other species of butterflies and moths. But the button bush, which is pictured on the top right, um, supports the Promethea moth, the Hydrangea sphinx, the saddleback caterpillar, and 18 other species of butterflies and moths. So the button bush supports 18 other species of butterflies and moths. Joe pie weed, which is on the bottom, supports three dozen species of butterflies and moths. So if you don't have Joe pie weed in your yard um, right now, um, that, that's a good one to add this year. Willows support morning cloaks, victory, and I.O. moths. The tulip tree, sweet bay, magnolia, and black cherry trees all support the tiger swallowtails. Spice, bush, spice bushes support the spice bush swallowtail. And we should be, oh, okay. And here are some of the butterfly. So, we just briefly talked about what caterpillars, which is the, the um, caterpillar stage of the butterfly. Now as adults, um, they like plants that are usually bright, often red, orange, yellow, or purple. Structurally, they often like a wide landing pad because you know they need a, a big place to fly and then land onto. Um, the Roma, they don't, they're not very um, keen into really aromatic um, plants. They like a slight aromatic, so nothing too, um, too pungent, I guess. Um, usually there is nectar present. There should be lots of nectar and deep within the plant. So they like plants that have nectar where they, it, it's deep inside the plant. And um, as far as pollen, um, the, they're not too concerned about that. Um, it can have a very limited, the plant can have a very limited amount of pollen. What they're really after as adults um, is the nectar. And some of the plants, I have a bigger list, and do include milkweed, New Jersey tea, Blue mist flower, the prairie clover, cone flowers, Joe Pie weed, sunflowers, blazing star, cherries and plums, goldenrods, asters, and iron weeds. Um, also, some that I would also include would include the blazing star, kernel flower, butterfly weed, 
purple coneflower, and the New York New England aster. Also, uh, make sure to include a sunken um, bath, um, shallow saucer filled with wet pebbles or sand. Um, like I said, um, give them a little bit of dirt that um, gets wet, and um, they will get butterflies will get their water source from wet mud. Um, so that's one thing um, extra you can do for them to provide their wet water source. Okay, let's go and talk briefly about moths. Okay. Moth. Um, some moth caterpillars are considered pests, yet adult moths have a crucial place in the natural food chain. Not only are they key food source for birds and other animals, they are also effective pollinators. We are still unsure how many plant specialists are actually pollinated by moths. So um, we're still looking um, into it. We are still discovering many moths. Um, it looks like I didn't provide the list here of moths. Um, I apologize for that. Um, I will edit this slide and add it to your, your PDF. Um, so for some reason, this wasn't saved. Okay, so we will continue. So the type of um, moths include um, as far as their plants, um, the flowers that they like are often pale, white, or pink, dull red, or purple. Structurally, um, they like ones that are clustered so that, again, they um, have landing platform. The aroma should be strong and sweet at night. So moss like a little bit of a stronger aroma than butterflies. Um, as far as nectar guides, they don't need any, but they, as far as the amount of nectar, they need lots of diluted nectar deep within. And again, they're not really concerned about the pollen. They're more concerned about that nectar. Okay. And let's get to the moth plants. So, um, plants that are pollinated that we know of by moths include milkweed, morning glory, blazing star, bee balms and bergamot, evening primrose, mock oranges, phloxes, cherries and plums, sages, catch flies, golden rods, and yuccas. They'll also like verbena, bee balm, black walnuts. Um, black walnut is the host plant for the luna moth. Um, as well as sweet gum. Um, a lot of sweet gums are also eaten by the luna moth. Um, coral honeysuckle is another favorite of moths. Many moths are attracted to light. It is best to use motion sensors for outdoor lighting. Okay, a lot of people don't realize, but Many plants are pollinated by flies as well. Okay, so they are possibly, flies are the possibly the least like pollinator. They are two winged insects and part are very large insect group. Many of them speci specifically visit flowers are not as hairy as bees and as efficient in carrying pollen, but some are good pollinators, are attracted to flowers that are protrude, odor, like rotten meat, heron, dung, humus, sap, and blood. Um, picture to the left is not a native bee of ours, but a native bee, um, bee from England. It's called a bee fly because it has this hairy body that kind of represents a bee, but it's actually a fly. We have pictured below some of the native flies in here in Maryland include the cephoid fly, the technid fly, the hoverfly, and the horsefly. 
So those are the flies that we have here living in Marin. Okay, the type of flowers that um, flies are attracted to are often dark brown, purple or pale. Structurally, they're often funnel shaped or complex. The aroma, again, it's putrid, runny flesh smell, so not very pleasant smelling flowers. Usually, there's no nectar guide for them. Um, usually, it's absent and there is some pollen in the plant. Um, they like jack in the pulpit, paw poultry, skunk cabbage, and twetillium. Um, also, flowers that, other flowers that are pollinated by flies include dog bame, pine vines, prairie clover, a few sunflowers, false sunflower, blazing stars, and the red trillium, which I pictured over there. Okay, okay back. Okay, so bats are amazing beneficial creatures pollinating hundreds of commercially significant plants, spreading fruit seeds and consuming multitudes of harmful insects like mosquitoes. There are more than 1,300 species of bats. The majority of bats are small, nocturnal, global, widespread mammals. They're warm-blooded vertebrates with fur that nurse their young. 40 bat species in the USA, all of them are insectivores, except for three flowering eating species. There are two basic suborders. The mega bat shed shows the fruit bats that weigh up to four pounds and they eat fruit, nectar, pollen. And um, the second um, suborder includes the micro bats, which are primarily eat insects, but also feed on nectar, pollen, fish, frogs, and blood. Pollinating bats are drawn to white or pale flowers with large bell-shaped blossoms, which mainly bloom at night. Nearly 500 species of trackable fruits, such as mangoes, bananas, ruva, kekko, agave, depend on bats for pollination. Bat species feed on whole fruit, play a key role in seed dis dispersal and, and reforestation. Bats can consume mosquitoes, maggots, gnats, and other flying insects um, 600 per hour. Like honeybees, bats are beset by the mysterious ailment that is depleting population at a starting rate. Um, this um, disease is called white nose syndrome, which kills 6 million bats and has been found in 25 states. There is currently no cure for this disease for them. So it, when a bat gets um, white nose syndrome, it's basically a death, a death sentence for them. Um, the bats that we have living here in Marinan include the silver hair bat, which is up top, the evening bat, the um, red, eastern red bat, and the hoary bat. And the lesson, I can't read that one. He has a long Latin name. But um, yep, we have these all these bats that here living in Maryland. Okay, have nothing else on that. Okay, so what do the flowers look like for bats? So often white or pale, green or purple. Structurally, they usually open at night. Aroma is high fragrant, fruity, and fermentinine. Um, as far as a nectar guide, there's none for them. Nectar, lots of dilute nectar. So they love um, plants with a lot of nectar. Um, as far as pollen, the more pollen, the better. <laughs> so um, they are attracted to plants with a lot of pollen. 
and let's see if I have the this. Okay, I have just a few uh, short list uh, for of um, plants that bats are attracted to. So these include the quarry honeysuckle, the moonflower, evening primrose, and peach. And um, here in Maryland, we have 10 species of bats. Lisa, how much um, longer do you have? We're at 11, 30, 13. Oh, OK. I have just hummingbirds, and I will do it quickly. OK, hummingbirds that you typically will find living in Maryland include the ruby-throated hummingbird, the rufous hummingbird, and island hummingbird. Hummingbirds over, over blooms, flowers, and unfurl their long tongues to feed on nectar within. What most people do not realize is that hummingbirds also feed on small insects and spiders, eating gardeners by consuming destructive aphids. They prefer tubular shaped flowers in bright red, orange, and pink colors such as scarlet trumpet vine or scarlet bee balm. They also enjoy wanting water features in the garden and will happily take advantage of a bird bath. So they are attracted to scarlet, red, orange, or white colored plants. They, um, structurally, they like large funnel shape. They don't care about their aroma or have a nectar guide. They require lots of nectar deep within, and there's some nectar for them. They are attracted to also scarlet book eye, trumpet creeper, summer sweet, um, bearded tongue, obedient plant, sweet azalea, wild petunia, sages, catflies, and Indian pinks. These are some of the plants for our area. Um, I'll also give you this list as well. Um, I will briefly talk about the tips here. 10 tips and five being a pollinator victory garden. Plant for a succession of blooming throughout the growing season. Skip double flowering plants. They have little and sometimes nectar or pollen. Emphasize native plants to support native pollinators in your ecosystem. Don't forget to include flowering trees, shrubs, and vines in your landscape. Pollinators need them. Plant a diverse way of plants with different flowering shapes sizes and colors, create for targets for pollinators, provide nesting sites for pollinators in your landscape, eliminate pesticides from your garden, reduce and eliminate your lawn and add a pollinator habitat sign to your landscape. Okay, right, that's it. Do we have time for questions? <laughs> I know it was a lot to um, cover in, in a short hour. Yes, we still have um, quite a bit of um, time for questions. Um, okay, and, and you're going to provide um, the extra um, plant list that you didn't include images with when you give me your slide, correct? Yes, I will provide all that information, extra information, um, and add anything that um, was missing when I converted my micro um, my Microsoft Office slide to um, a slide, um, a Google slide. For whatever reason, that information was deleted, and I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Okay, so I'm gonna review the um, Q and A questions first, and then I'll go on to chat. So one person asked about providing a native plant list, and in case you didn't notice. Um, I did provide a link um, through the nativeplantcenter.net. It's also a, um, a um, book form that you can um, borrow through the Calvert Library. And if there is a plant in that um, nativeplantcenter.net um, list that you want, um, a good location or a source um, to buy these plants are through chesapeakenatives.org. 
Um, we are not trying to promote them, but they are a great organization to know about in our area. Someone also asked about um, green mulch landscapes. Um, they specifically wanted um, pictures, but if you want to understand how to use your grass clippings and your um, leaves as a green mulch, um, the Marinan Extension um, ex um, has a good source um, for mulching. So if you visit um, extension.umd.edu and type mulching, it'll provide you with that. So Lisa doesn't have to um, give you too much information on that. Just visit that um, site. Did you want to Say anything about I just that? wanted to add, I think they were asking when I um, was referring to green mulch to ground covers. Mm -hmm. So ground covers would include like creeping flocks, um, what else, um, mountain mint, um, things that you could grow underneath the taller plants. Okay, I think okay. that's what they were talking about. Um, I will provide a list of green mulch um, plants to give to you all um, that will benefit pollinators as well. So I think that's what they were referring to was um, okay, gotcha. the green mulch, which is actually um, planting lower um, ground covers um, to, so that when it rains, you don't have any ground um, showing. Okay, any soil. Dirt. Yeah, any soil so that so that any water doesn't get escaped. Okay, gotcha. I think that's and, what they were referring to. Okay, and then someone noticed when you had the list of um, butterfly um, plants that they were perennials. Is that the case that most of the plants that butterflies are attracted to are in the perennial family? And that is correct. Um, a lot of um, um, when I was doing my research for the um, the plants, um, they prefer perennials because they know it's going to be in the same spot year after year, um, and um, they they will typically they their eggs whether it's a, a moth or a um, butterfly within the same spot that they grew up in. So if you have a big bundle of like say milkweed, the um you're gonna have you're gonna notice that more and more um monarchs are going to go and leave their offspring at that patch because they know where it is. They have that in instinct that this is a safe place. To raise my young and that's what that's the you know that's the goal when you're developing any kind of wildlife um had habitat or garden is in future generations they'll know where to go because it's it's safe um for them um so yeah i mean yeah um yeah <laughs> okay and then another person um what, um, so that you mentioned sunflowers and that she was concerned that some sunflowers are coated in neopides. Yes. So um, can you talk about um, trying to buy um, seeds that are not GMOs and oh. um, how to find those varieties or um, okay. what seeds that you would suggest? Okay, so, <clears throat> so when buying seeds, the best way, I mean, the worst way is, um, unfortunately, right now, um, Walmart is selling a whole bunch of seed, and I can't 100% guarantee that none of those will have any of those chemicals. So if you have a big concern as far as um, seeds getting coated with that, I would go to organic seed producers. So these include seed savers, it includes um, rare seeds. Um, I will also include that in my handout as well of um, where to get your seeds. 
Um, these are companies that I recommend anybody um, because I've um, gotten seeds from them for years. Um, and they are, they're known to many gardeners as being um, organic um, gardeners. So they won't use any of that sprays. They won't do anything to the seed. Um, it's just pure um, seed. So I'll give you that list too. And um, with that, can you also include like the imagery of, you know, what you're looking for when you're looking at the seed packets? Because I know we were talking about um, okay. that there's a logo that you can find to say, okay, this is GMO safe. And... Okay. I can, oh. I can add that. Okay. And then um, someone asked about hybrid plant, um, hybrid plants, and I answered that. But um, can and um, let's see, I put down that it's a result of cross pollinate, pollinating two different plant varieties and growing the seed, um, the mixed produce. Um, most of the time, you can tell of a hybrid seed is because you can't um, use them in the following year. And um, a lot of hybrids that you will find is in, in vegetables. And the example was um, Better Boy. Do you have anything else to add to that, Adisa? Um, you kind of have to be careful. Some, there are some flowers that are hybrids. So I believe there's like a hybrid of a zinnia, but um, usually it will go and tell you on the seed packet that you're looking at a hybrid. Um, it will be clearly labeled that this is a hybrid. Um, usually hybrid seeds will also have a special license to where you can't, I mean, you plant it one year and you can't save the seed from that plant um, because it is actually illegal to do so. Mm -hmm. um, because that, that particular company has that, um, um, created that plant and um, they have the license um, to sell that plant and um, nobody else can basically save the seeds from that. And, and like you said, even if you were to seed it, you wouldn't get the same results. Mm -hmm. And then um, also, I think, um, I think another flower that you have to be careful with hybrids is coneflower. I think coneflower yes, there's is another one that you have to be careful too. Yeah, there's like a like a bright orange or a bright red cone flower that isn't even native. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, know, I noticed that there's like a cone flower mix and um, it will clearly say hybrid um, because most of the cone flower you really wanna look for is the purple one. Um, okay, and then um, you talked about um, stuff that is harmful to the environment. They were wondering, is Lyme considered dangerous as well for the environment? I haven't read anything as far as Lyme because um, it is used to, I believe, um, fix something within the um, soil itself. Um, I haven't read anything so far as far as um, Lyme. Um, I think if like your P, pH is something's wrong with your pH or something like that. Um, just read the label on everything you put into the soil. But my recommendation is if you're really concerned with the makeup of your, your, your soil or if it's too clay or too sandy, always put um, organic material back into your soil to fix it. Mm -hmm. it's usually, okay. yeah, and I also usually. included a um, resource about Lyme and that it's as far as the resources I found was that it's not toxic and yeah. like you said it's mainly poorly to help um, with your pH and acidic of the soil. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, do you have on alternatives to knee for noise that are environmentally safe? There's, I mean, as far as neonicotinoids, there's nothing that's safe. 
okay. if you're going to spray it. If, it. if it's a spray, it's not safe. Um, it's better, like, um, if you have mosquitoes, um, it's always go um, with the alternative, plant something that mosquitoes hate. Um, so that includes um, lavender, includes rosemary, anything minty will um, keep mosquitoes um, at bay. So um, what I like to do is I like to plant a mint or something um, in a pot, put it by my door so that in the summer, um, I don't have to worry about mosquitoes coming into my house because um, something like a mint will deter them from coming anywhere near the doorway. Same thing with ticks. Um, find out what ticks are attracted to. And if they're attracted to a certain type of plant, um, find something that will basically take them away um, rather than spraying. Um, the one thing is, you know, once you spray for mosquitoes, it's in your soil, it's in, it's in your plants for years. It's not just you spray it once and it's gone. It's, it's there for a long time. Well, and you have the danger of adding it to your water too. Exactly, and if you're by a water source, you know, all uh, the, once you spray it, it goes right into those streams and estuaries. Okay, and then um, you said something about um, mowing by the center um, versus the edging. Can you um, elaborate more on that? They didn't understand why that is important. Okay, so um, um, I read that in the Humane Gardener book by Nancy Lawson. Um, and it was one of her humane gardener um, uh, suggestions. And the reason why she said to start from the middle um, rather than the edging is um, any insect um, that is feeding, like say you have a bunch of, I don't know, wild weed that's blooming and you, you, um, start on the edging and there's some in the middle. Well, if you start in the middle, it gives them a chance to first fly and then they're gonna go from um, the middle outwards. Whereas if you start in from outwards and in, there's no way for them to escape. They're basically, you're basically creating a island of unmowed grass right in the middle because you're starting from the edging and then as so think of your 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 um lawn as a big island and it's square say it's square so you start from the edging and you're making that island smaller and smaller and smaller versus if you start in the middle you make that island bigger because you started in the middle um, and by the time you hit to the end, um, they're in what I call the safe zone, which is the edging. So I think that's what she was talking about. And this is mainly if you go around. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, let me see. Um, someone asked about um, persimmon trees that are native in Maryland, which I did include. Um, that DNR um, suggested. So um, hope I will include all of these links and answers to these questions. Um, when I sent everybody the attachment, um, I gave the link um, of that native um, persimmon um, and that source. And then it said, um, besides reducing your lawn size, how is there any other way to reduce the Japanese beetles? Um, if, if you have something like you grow roses, you can use, um, plants that deter them. So I've noticed that, um, things like chives and catnip and I think it's the big ones are chives and catnip will deter, um, the Japanese beetles from, from feeding off, um, 
I've done that for the past two years around um, some roses and um, there's very few, they'll get them when um, the, they'll, they'll be around, the Japanese beetle will be around before those plants start growing, but the, they'll, there won't be as big of a bite once those plants are at their peak. Um, and as long as you, you have something that deters them from eating anything that you don't want them eating, um, that's all you can do. Um, another thing I've heard, seen people um, pick at the Japanese beetles or any pests and just put them in a jar filled with water and nick with soap and just kill them. That's all you can really do. Can you go back to the um, slide that you listed the hummingbird um, flowers that they like? Okay, and a new question um, was asked, what should we be doing in our garden right now for success? For what? What should we be doing for our garden right now for to have a successful growing season? Um, there's not much for you to do. What you could do is if it's available is add organic um, material. So get bags or a truckload of, of um, uh, leaf glow um, and um, you could do a, you know, a half and half of of leaf grow and a half of um, uh, of soil and mix it together and just regenerating your soil content in the gardens. Um, you can do that right now. Um, you can also start a new garden right now by simply um, getting it ready um, by killing the grass. Um, you can kill the grass by just putting some um a uh, cardboard on where you want it and but make sure to put something like rocks or bricks on top of the cardboard and then once um you start seeing the bees and butterflies the first time you um you mow your your lawn rather than just you know letting the grass just collect it and put it where you put that um cardboard um, right on top and then put some some um, leaf grow and that's how you can start your garden. So you can do a few things right now. Um, I wouldn't start cleaning or um, if you still have leaves, I want to do that until you start noticing uh, um, a lot of bees um, coming out. Um, the bees are the end um, basically indicates when we can start doing our yard cleanup and et cetera. Um, because once we know that, we know that, okay, the it's safe for us to, to um, mow or ground up the leaves because a lot of insects like bees and butterflies and um, beetles use the leaf litter that we have right now down as um, a safe place to to hibernate and sleep. Um, but right now, I haven't seen any bees, um, so they're still sleeping. So we want to wait to do any of that until we notice a little bit more activity. Um, but you can go and start ordering leaf grow and adding stuff to your your garden beds because i'm sure like mine need a lot of work um as far as bringing in more organic material um so that's what i would first do um probably and right and probably right now it's not a good time to really start one really once you have the resources and you can start grounding your yeah. and stuff it's that's the best time to really yeah in that um yeah. And, and yeah planning i mean right now is planning 
and finding out, okay, what plants do I have space for? So if you're looking into creating a pollinator garden, the best thing is figuring out, okay, what shrub do I want? What perennials I want? And create a list so that when they become available, you're able to purchase, purchase them. But like I said, um, the only thing you can do right now is, is prep your, your, um, your garden by adding um, more organic material. And um, someone also start, um, suggested also start your, um, your seeds indoors as well. Yep, you can do that too. Um, especially if you have um, seeds, you can start those right now. And most natives need some form of stratification. Correct? Exactly, yes. Um, right now, it's probably too late to start them outside. So if you have a package of, of native seeds um, that have not been put in the refrigerator, I would put them in the refrigerator today. They need up to 30 to 50 days in order to stratify. Um, so they, those seeds that you put in the refrigerator right now won't be ready until probably May or June to actually sow in the ground. As well as hyssop and lavender are some of the herbs that also need a little stratification um, only four weeks to in, in the um, refrigerator as well. Does anybody else have any questions, comments before we end this session? Um, someone wanted to ask, does leaf grow promote weed, weed growth and is it clean? Um, did you want to answer that, Adisa? It, it all depends on where you get it, really. Um, so um, typically, if your source is really good and they, they, the leaves were able to um, be grounded up correctly, there shouldn't be any weeds um, that get promoted in, in the leaf grow. It, it all depends on your resource. Um, like any other compost, um, you have to make sure that it gets really hot in order for any um, seeds, whether it's a vegetable seed, whether it's a weed seed, to actually die. So um, if, if um, you have to make sure that um, where you get your, your leaf grow or compost is a good source. Just like your topsoil, you have, I mean, you can get weeds from topsoil. So you have to make sure wherever you're getting your topsoil or your, your compost from that they're a good source. Okay, I see someone's hand. So let me let them talk. Mimi, did you have something to say? I just wanted to make a plug on the fact that the master gardeners are going are right now they will be having a, a plant sale and I think it's May 1st and some of the plants that um, Elisa has uh, talked about um, specifically the cardinal flower and the bee balm I know for for um, a fact that they will be having um, those items as for sale. Okay, thank you. And it's going to, it's an online sale though. So I'm sure that in Facebook, um, Jennifer and Elisa will post, you know, the link. And it also will be under the Calvert County Master Gardener Extension website. And I believe um, the Calvert Library also has it on their um, events page. So I'll make sure that it gets added to once it becomes available. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments, questions before we end this session? 
I want to thank everybody so much for um, participating today in this um, Garner Smarter. The next one is um, the 27th on rain gardens. And then our April ones are include gardening in a climate change. Um, and then April 10th, we have a companion planting. And then another one, especially if you wondered um, about reducing your lawn, they're going to be talking about weeds and ground covers on April 24th. If no one else has any questions, I guess we'll um, end um, this um, program. Thank you for um, joining us today. Thank you, everybody, and good luck for um, everybody who's starting seats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. No problem. So I ended YouTube, I believe.